Well, good morning again. And uh, even though it's um, still 2023, I'd like you to think of today's message as kind of a, a message that fits into the New Year's resolution category. And I think the same will have to be said also for next Sunday when we look at Psalm 2. Most of the Psalms are prayers in the form of a song, but Psalm 1 and 2 are proclamations. They draw a line in the sand in some ways, or another way you can look at it is Psalm 1 and 2. They set the foundation for all the other Psalms that follow and what we are to expect from the Psalms. And before we dig into Psalm 1, I want to start with a preface. It's an unwritten preface. Psalm 1 and 2 are kind of the preface to the book of the Psalms, and I'm going to give an unwritten preface to Psalm 1 and 2. And it's implied, but we need to understand it up front. So the preface I want us to think about before we dive into the Psalm is this. This is the way of the saved, not the way to be saved. The Psalms are about the way of the saved, not the way to be saved. It's about the saved people, the believers expressing themselves and expressing themselves in their daily lives. In the Ten Commandments, if you um, would go, go back to, uh, say, say, maybe even Deuteronomy where it's repeated, um, the preface to the Ten Commandments is, I am the Lord your God, your God, that brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. So God announces that he is the God who rescued them and then now that he has rescued them to be his people, this is the way they ought to live. You see, they, they are rescued first and then the Ten Commandments are about the way that the rescued people ought to live. The Old Testament law was never given to us um, as a guide to find God, but it's a guide to live with God. There's a difference. In 1 Peter chapter 2, um, it's written, You are a chosen people called out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. So rescued, you're rescued. And then from that, he launches into, now that you are rescued people, this is how you ought to live and present yourselves. Romans Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And the rest of Romans 12 talks about what that means, what it looks like. You are rescued by the mercy of God. So, so mercy and rescue and salvation, all that stuff is God's work. That's his generous gift to you and me. Never in the scriptures does it God say, if you follow these rules and if you're a good person, then I will rescue you. It's never that way. And we need to be really clear about that. It's essential for understanding the Psalms that this is about the way of the saved, not the way to be saved. And it's also essential for understanding the death and resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus. We have to be saved first before we call to live his way. So the Psalms, this, this is my long preface, the Psalm is the expression of the emotional life of believers. And, and knowing it's about the way of the Psalms helps us in many different ways. It can even help us to define words like the wicked and the righteous, which come up in this Psalm, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Let's jump into it. Psalm 1, starting at verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. So the first lesson I want us to think about is flourishing in God's word 
and with his people. There's this illustration, the main illustration. Let me start with that. It's, it's, it's this lovely, positive illustration. Here's, here's a picture I've found. Somebody's manipulated it to, to fit this psalm. So here we have this you know, beautiful, lush scenery. It's always green, beautiful river running through it, a tree with fruit on it. It's a great place to be. And uh, you might not be able to tell very clearly from what's on the screen, but the, the, the brown thing underneath the tree, someone's got really smart and clever and, 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 and put in something that's supposed to look like a Bible. Why did they do that? Well, because that Bible symbolizes what it says here in verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. To flourish, you need to be engaging with God's word. To flourish, you need to be reading God's word, the Bible, the scriptures. You need to be not only reading it, but learning from it and putting it into practice. The Bible, God's word, is something that you and I need to take seriously. And I think it's also important for us to say, because it at times gets a little tricky, the flourishing is... Not so much about you know, our physical health or our material wealth. Sometimes in a psalm it kind of looks like that. But that's not really the main emphasis in the psalms. The emphasis is flourishing in our soul. Flourishing as in our, you know, our character makeup. Our spiritual flourishing. If your soul is going to flourish, The Bible needs to be a meaningful part of your daily life. That's what it's telling us. But there's something else as well. It's the company that you and I keep. Verse 1 is stated in the negative. Avoid these kind of people. Let me just flip that around for the moment and think of the positive. Because we are meant to think about the positive, even as it talks about the negative. But let me just flip it around a little bit who, what are the kind of people we're supposed to spend time with? Well, we're supposed to spend time with people who love the Lord. We're supposed to spend time with people who believe that Jesus is the Saviour and the Bible is God's word that helps us to live and grow and flourish on planet Earth according to his design. If you were to go to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4 is this wonderful passage where it's talking about how when all of us are together and encouraging one another, that's when we begin to grow as individuals and together to grow to be more like Jesus. We need to be together in Christian community, in a believing community. What does that look like? Well, it does mean coming to church on Sundays and, and learning and singing together and meeting together and chatting at um, morning tea. It means all those kinds of things. But it also includes you know, being part of a Bible study or catching up with others one-on-one -on -one and, and, and sharing each other's lives and encouraging each other. There, there's lots of different ways we can do it. But... I've just got a few images there to sort of highlight that spending time with God's people is something that helps you flourish. What's the opposite? What is bad for you? Well, verse 1 says, um, don't walk in the counsel, in the advice of the wicked. Let us just define wicked at this point in time as people who are shady. You know, if you're running a business, why would you go to someone who you know likes to bend the rules? Unless you also want to bend them. Don't go to the shady people for counsel and advice. And then it uses the idea of standing or stand in the way of the sinners. And it's like, I think what it's saying is don't hang out with people who deliberately get up to mischief and like to break the law. 
And the final category it says, or sit in the seat of mockers. Why spend lots of time with people who make fun of believing that there's a God in heaven? Who make fun of your Christian faith because they think it's just superstition? Why spend time with those kind of people who, who mock the idea of religion? I think what I need to say at this point, so that we don't get on the wrong track too much, it's not saying don't make friends with these kind of people. It's not saying that. It's not saying keep away from these people totally. We are called to make all sorts of friends. And we're to pray for people that we make friends with. And we're to pray that if we have flourishing spiritual lives, that our flourishing spiritual lives will influence them positively. The point of Psalm 1 is this. You can only flourish if the main input to your life is if you're mixing with God's people. If the main input are those who are not interested in the things of God, then it's going to drag you down. That's the main point of verse 1. And this kind of leads me into the next thought I want us to think about is the desert outside of God's word for life. The soul cannot flourish when the soul is disconnected from God and when the soul is disconnected from his words for life, his advice for life, his direction for life. Now, I know the psalm doesn't refer to a desert. But I believe the psalmist wants you to think about a desert in verse 3. Because what's the opposite of being in that lush green place with the river? What's the opposite of that? The opposite is a desert, isn't it? So just for a moment, let's think about the idea of the opposite. The desert, you're not by a stream. If you're not by a stream, where are you? You're in a spiritual desert. You can grow, but you won't flourish as if you're by that river. Uh, just recently I was listening to a blog that had an interesting title that went something like, What happened to the new atheists? Where do they go? Even the energetic evangelist Richard Dawkins has suddenly gone silent. Where do they all go? This whole new atheist movement was presented with a lot of razzmatazz and it was kind of like the best thing since sliced bread and we'd all be delivered from our superstitions and religion would just fade away completely. But what happened to the new atheists? The new atheist movement has withered and it has dried up and kind of disappeared from the conversation. Why? Because it's spiritually and morally a desert. Once people worked out that what it's saying is there's no meaning to life. Once the people worked out that's what it was saying, they worked out that means there's no meaning to my life. And it's not a satisfying narrative of life. It's not very compelling. So people are kind of turn them back on this wonderful new movement, the new atheism. The new atheism is a world without God and it's a desert. It's a place where people can't flourish. So it started with a big bang, but then it has faded. Let's now turn to what the Psalm, Psalm 1 says actually says about those who do not follow God's way or live with God's people. Verse 4 and 5. So we've got this wonderful image in verse 3, and then it says, not so the wicked. And it introduces us to a new idea. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. 
and therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. What does he mean by wicked? I think we need to answer that question. So I decided to make a little diagram. When the Psalms talk about the wicked, it's using really black and white language. And basically what it's saying, you either worship God or you don't. That's what it's really saying. So when you think of something in the Psalms and it refers to the wicked, I want you to think of a sliding scale. Yes, there are very bad people that are called wicked. And sometimes the very bad people are used because they're the best illustration of that side of life. But when we think about wicked in general, I think we ought to think not just about the bad people who we know are bad, but also very good people. Unbelievers can be really nice people. Unbelievers can be quite moral. Unbelievers can be wise. All those kinds of things. But in the Psalms, they're just lumped in with one group. They're not believers. Scripture tells us not only that we're just all made in the image of God, but in Romans 2 it says that that every person who's born on planet Earth has the law of God written inside of them. And people's consciences can vary to different degrees. But because the law of God is inside of us, even unbelievers can be the best of people on the planet Earth. And, and, And a great blessing for planet Earth. But just because you're in the image of God and you have the law of God inside you doesn't mean that you're a believer. There's a difference. Nice people can be wise. Nice people can be good to hang out with. But they're not the kind of people that will help you flourish if they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and worship the living God. Why are the good people lumped in with the wicked title? Well, in the end, unbelief is a lack of gratitude towards God. God gives us life, he gives us food, he gives us friends, he gives us family, he gives us air to breathe. And to not acknowledge the creator God is ingratitude. Unbelief is also a rejection of his love. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit agreed that the Son would come to the earth to to represent us, to live on planet earth and then die for us and rise so that we might have eternal life. That is the greatest expression of love, the greatest definition of love is that God sent his only Son into the world. And unbelief, he says, reject that love. Here's a verse for us to think about. It's from 1 John chapter 3. And this is his command. This is the Father's command, God the Father, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. And to love one another as he commanded us. So the first step is to believe in the Son, of God, the Lord Jesus. And then flows from that, living according to his pattern. Anything less than that is disobedience in God's eyes. And therefore we have the psalm speaking in blunt terms. Verse 5, therefore the wicked, the unbeliever, will not stand in the day of judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. You cannot be part of God's future if you do not make him part of your life now. The unbeliever here, the image in verse 4, is chaff. We're not so familiar with that, especially 
as city folk. But um, in ancient times, and it still happens in some cultures, um, you know, they, they, they gather, the, gather the sheaves of wheat and then you take it to what's called the threshing floor and you, you, you bash it against something or in some cultures they actually rode a sleigh, sleigh over the top and it sort of ground the, 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 the grain that's in the husk. And the idea is by the bashing and the threshing process is that you, you separate the grain from the husk that surrounds it. But you end up with a bit of a mess. So the next step is winnowing, where things are tossed into the air. And the grain, because it's heavier, falls straight down, and the wind blows away the husks and, and the rubbish. That's the chaff. Jesus told parables about separations, and one of the most famous ones is, of course, the separation of the sheep and the goats. If you have not committed your life to the Lord Jesus, what scripture is saying, your soul is like chaff and it will be separated and, and shifted and blown away with the wind. And that's rather a rather gloomy picture. And it doesn't have to be that way. Let me show you another verse, one you may have, many of us have heard of. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not be blown away as chaff, but have eternal life. Unbelief makes you chaff. But God is holding out his hand in the Lord Jesus and saying, this is the way to life. Please, as you think about these things, don't think about it lightly. It's serious business. Even if you don't necessarily believe it, let me say the word of God says it, so therefore it is serious. Faith in Jesus is the first step towards flourishing. And if you need to talk about that more, that is a good thing to do. Can I just shift a little bit and focus on those of us who already believe in the Lord Jesus? Verse 6 is like the final encouragement to flourish. And I think I'm going to label verse 6 under the big category of remember your destiny. Verse 6. For the Lord watches over the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The Lord watches over the righteous. Let's ask the other question, who are the righteous? A diagram again. I'm, I'm a diagram person. Hope it helps you. Who are the righteous? The righteous are believers. Nothing more complicated than that. It's not saying that there's this category of people who are good and perfect and true. It's just saying these are believers. Um, in the Old Testament, that was the ones who believed the living God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who called them out of Egypt and rescued them from slavery. And the God who would forgive sin to all those who repent. And because of we live in the New Testament times, we know God has revealed more and for us, being a believer is someone who believes in the Lord Jesus, Jesus who came from heaven, was incarnate, who lived and died and rose and ascended back into heaven so that we might be reconciled to God. That's what, who, who the righteous are in the Psalms, the believer. And just like unbelievers, believers are on a sliding scale. We can be really immature. We can be foolish and we can be really bad examples of what it is to be a Christian. Of course, there are others who are very mature, who are wise and are really good examples of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And hopefully, we're somewhere in between but more towards the other end, the good end. Uh, 
there's this, you know, the wonderful um, description that John Dixon has somewhere that, that sometimes we play in tune with Jesus and sometimes we don't. But, but when you come to the Psalms and if you've come across the righteous, it doesn't mean that it's talking about the perfect person. It's talking about the believer. And we can be mixed up and there can be all sorts of quality in our following of Jesus. But the point is, the inner compass is focused on the God of heaven and earth. Believers are the people who are justified by God through faith alone in Christ alone. And not by personal effort. So what's the long and the short of the message I want you to take away from verse 6? I think the long and the short of it is this. Do not forget, as he's, sum, as he's cycling and summarising, do not forget that you belong to the Heavenly Father who loves you and cares for you and he watches over you day and night. You belong to him. You belong to him. Live like you do. That's the implication. Live like you belong to the Heavenly Father. And if you do that, your soul will flourish. Let me close with a story about two trees. It's kind of a parable. On my left is a sequoia. On my right is the bristlecone. The sequoia is on the west side of the Sierra Nevadas. It doesn't show up fantastic on that map, but um, that, that sort of reddish thing in the middle represents the Sierra Nevada range in California. And the sequoias are on the west side, and the west side is the side that gets all the rain. On the other side, it's like a rain shadow. And the picture, the tree that in the center of this picture here, that's um, called the General Sherman. And it's considered the biggest living single organism on planet Earth. When you stand underneath it, it's hard to comprehend, but they say in volume the trunk is equal to 15 blue whales. This tree is so enormous, it's like being at a big cliff and you can't understand just how big it is. But it's big. It's the biggest thing. And, and it's a great symbol of flourishing. And it's, it's living in a, in, a, in a forest of other sequoias. On the other hand, the bristlecone is on the east side of the Sierra Nevadas. Okay. Oh. <laughs> it's flipped around. I'm looking at it up here. And um, it, it's on the east side and it's in the rain shadow side and it lives in harsh conditions, extremely harsh conditions. It survives and in fact it, it is famous for its surviving. There's one tree, crystal cone tree, that is almost 5,000 years old according to the experts. That means that that tree was around in the time of Abraham. That's old. That's ancient. So it survives in harsh conditions, but it does not flourish because it's in harsh conditions. What about you in 2024? Are you going to flourish like a giant sequoia? Are you going to be in the place where there's lots of nourishment for your soul so you can flourish? Or are you going to be like the bristlecone, which survives, but it's in a harsh place? And I deliberately chose the bristle cone for this illustration because I want to make another point. 
and that is you will survive even if you keep bad company. You will survive even if you don't read God's word because your salvation is not dependent on you. It's dependent on the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus said, all who are given to me will come to me and I will receive them and I will lose none. Jesus says, no one can snatch my people out of my hand. Your security before God, your justification before God depends on Jesus. So that's why I've used the Bissell claim. You will survive. But you won't flourish if you keep the wrong company. You won't flourish if you ignore God's word. The Psalm 1 is calling you and me and saying, choose flourishing. Trust God, yes, for your salvation, but choose flourishing. Live in his word. Mix with his people and have your soul enriched. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word speaks to us in, in so many different ways and we thank you for the book of Psalms which expresses the ups and downs, the joys and disappointments and confusions of, of believers and the experience of these ancient believers is our experience as well. But help us to understand the foundation statement of flourishing in your word and flourishing by being with your people. We pray this in Jesus' name.